So Guided by Voices, Alien Lanes. This comes out in 1995. This is, man, you put me to work. This is 28 songs. And even though that 28 song sounds overwhelming, it still only clocks in at 41 minutes. So what can you tell us about this album? Well, you know, I knew I knew I had to have on this list uh, a, a 90s indie rock album. And my choices were this or or Pavement Wowie Zowie or maybe Soft Bulletin or, or uh, Spiritualized Ladies and Gentlemen, We Are Floating in Space. And I went with this one. And then I thought, oh, I don't know if that was the right choice. And then just a couple of days ago, I listened to it all the way through, partly because I wanted to I wanted to know recognize what every song was so i have i have them listed here with like cheat notes to like to remember oh right it's this song and it to me this album sounds like it sounds like one of the greatest bands of all time their greatest hits collection it's just there's no there's no bad song uh, there's only short songs uh, and so they they're it, he's able to distill what's he's able to recognize what's great and 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 you know that's that's what a producer does you like take away the bad stuff and accentuate the good stuff and th- i mean this one is just it <laughs> the funny story about this one is is when i was hanging around in toronto in the in the 90s we all went to rotate this on Queen Street, uh, right between just uh, west of Bathurst, and uh, a guy named Chris Harper was was uh, worked there. It was owned by a guy named Pierre. I think it's still around. I think it moved around the corner a while ago. I think Pierre still runs it. Uh, Chris has long since moved on. He has a bar called Pharmacy in Parkdale, and Chris was the ultimate arbiter of good taste. And he told you what albums to buy and what albums not to buy. And, and I went in, I, I read about Guided by Voices. I'm like, wow, this it sounds like this band is for me. And I said, Chris, should I buy Alien Lanes? And he said, I said, Bill, do you have the white album? I said, yes. He said, then you don't need it. <laughs> I told him about that the last one of the last times I saw him five or 10 years ago. He said, God, I was such an asshole back then. <laughs> So when the next album came out, I bought that and I went, oh yeah, this, this band is for me. And I went back and, and listened to this. It's, it's flawlessly uh, uh, sequenced. You know, the first album is the, the first song is an introduction. It's, you know, the club is open. They had, they actually had a song, a sign that said the club is open. Uh and then the the last song is is a is an ending song, and the the penultimate song always crush me is just that that kind of second last like super super heavy intense song, and in between it just it, again, uh, and then the important thing to understand is this is a four track a Tascam four track recording with a. A cheap realistic microphone like not even a not even a 57 like a stereo realistic a microphone uh famously you probably read this as well they got a hundred thousand dollar advance and it cost ten dollars which is probably they, like a little yeah box. they said it, if we took out all the money we spent on beer the album would be yeah. about ten dollars because it would I, be like a box of of cassette tapes of max l xl 90s and it just it's it sequenced so perfectly. And again, like Fear of Music, the the four track allows it to occupy this bizarre sonic space that just shape shifts all the time. I mean that you know the, the Steely Dan record, it's very diverse, but it's kind of grounded in this, but in a single 45 second song so many of these songs will just dramatically change the the four track has the ability to make it this incredible soundscape of of like what's going on you know uh what's the one i'm thinking of uh 
it's hard to find within 28 songs you know it's hard to find it a song that just it it, it repeats this line sometimes i get the feeling i that you don't want me around it's very garagey and it stops after 15 seconds and then it goes into this middle with a little bit of acoustic guitar and then it goes back to the beginning but it sounds totally different it has a harmony but everything that the vocals sound different the 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 drums and guitar sound different but the whole thing is over in about 33 seconds and it just takes you on this I always thought like okay that beginning is okay but it's a little and then the when it reintroduces it with a harmony it's like oh now now it makes sense I think it's Pimple Zoo. Yeah, it's called Pimple Zoo. So the, the, you're describing this lo-fi, um, you know, four-track cassette recorder, that that sound. That's not just this album. That's what they're known for. Is that yeah. right? Yeah. Uh, well, they started out... See, Guided by Voices is just the strangest albums. You talked about 100 episodes. Robert Pollard a couple of years ago, past the 100 album mark. He has made, so I would, and he's, for the last at least 10 years, he's put out at least three albums a year. He's essentially shooting himself in the foot because no one can listen to three albums a year by an artist year after year after year. I'm constantly, every so often, I, I run across a newer song and I go, oh, I, I, I thought it was over for for Robert Paul. I thought he'd like blown his load, and that was it. And I hear a song, I'm like, wow, this is as good as the, the, the classic period. So this is the the highlight, the maybe the highlight of the classic period of Guided by Voices. So this is a band at this point. He's a 37 year old elementary school teacher in Dayton, Ohio, and not even Dayton. You know when when I started getting into them and hearing about it was always Dayton, Ohio. And I read the biography and all his buddies are like, why do you keep saying Dayton? It's what We live in fucking Northridge. Like it's just a, a, just outside, a right? shitty part of Dayton. <laughs> Apparently about two or three albums before this, his wife and his wife's parents took him out to dinner and said, Hey, you know, I know you're uh, you really like this music thing, but you know, maybe it's time to start concentrating on being a teacher and just put this music thing to rest and just shortly after that somehow a tape wound up in the hands of Gerard Cosloy the founder of Matador Records and they were they went they played CBGB and Thurston Moore from Sonic Youth was there and the Beastie Boys were there and this was the height of grunge where what you did live was you know you you stood there with a stern look on your face you know very calm and in control well these guys they they played like the who like he robert pollard does karate kicks and mic twirls and <laughs> and they all just and and these all these two cool indie rock guys were like wow this is the most amazing thing i've ever seen and they were like they're a great live band it's totally different than what they do in the recording. They're both great because because the songs are great, but somehow the songs work with four track perfectly. One of the things is I remember around the time, the early '90s, if you listen to almost any major label recording with an acoustic guitar on it, the acoustic guitar sounded awful. <laughs> they they they. Engineers seem to have lost the ability, or they were relying too much on pickups. It would have this like overly treble, trebly. It didn't sound like a great '60s or '70s, except "Got It by Voices" because they, you know, I I think like if if there's no hiss, if there's no tape hiss, your acoustic guitar is not going to sound good. And they 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 understood that. So the the acoustic sounds are so real and organic and full sounding i was going to mention their uh prolific output you know if, if a if, if a band releases i don't know eight full-length albums in their career i mean that's that's pretty good these guys they have 35 like the band itself guided by voices 35 
full length albums. It's yeah, that's insane. I mean, how is that even yeah. possible? I mean, that pales in comparison to the hundred albums you said that one of the members has released. But yeah, well, and but he's the band. I mean, the the he's the only constant member in the band. Um, they've they've done this was the classic period. They've done tours recently with the classic period, but they, you know, I saw them in. 15 years ago, they had a different lineup than what they have today. It's always young guys that want to want to play. And, um, and and they had, you know, like I was talking about earlier about runs of amazing albums. This period from 1993 to 1998, I think he put out three solo albums. They're all amazing. And all the, all the albums are amazing. Uh, There's just no... I, I consider this album flawless. It's there's a song called X Supermodel. It has it has snoring on it, very high in the mix. I don't know if you recognize that. There's an electric guitar and Pollard singing and snoring because he had a he's a drinker, Robert Pollard. He he had a he you know he was lived in the suburbs with his wife and his kids. And in the backyard, he had a clubhouse called the Monument Club and his buddies would come over and drink. So they recorded some guy snoring one night and it's really nasty snoring. And it's, again, really high in the mix. And I'm convinced that if you took the snoring out, the song would be too good. It would, it would, it would hurt your, it would destroy your brain. He's, I think Robert Pollard's peers in melodicism are Paul McCartney, and I think he's one of the greatest melody writers of all time. Um, uh, the uh, Mitch from from Dawn Vale that we were talking about in our interview, he's a giant guided by voices fan like me. Um, and one day I was saying, I said to him. So, like is Robert Pollard just the best rock singer of all time? And Mitch said, "No, no, he's not." And I thought, "Oh, I guess you're right." I mean, he's drunk all the time, so he doesn't always sing so well. He, but he's he. It's a cross between John Lennon, Peter Gabriel, and and uh, Roger Daltrey. But he's such a gifted melodicist that it comes across like he's the greatest singer of all time because he just he can't write a bad melody. Do you think he's underappreciated as an artist? Well, that's who I don't know what that term means. I mean, it it's it was the 90s. He was an indie rock, you know, like I said, if it if it were the 70s, he would be Steely Dan. Okay, he would sell lots of records, but that wasn't going to happen in the in the nineties. Things had, you know, indie rock was indie rock was invented because things went so wrong in the eighties because ma- major labels signed shitty bands, and if you wanted to be a great band, you like the Replacements or the Pixies or Sonic Youth, you 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 were in the in- indie territory, whereas. So- in- 70s you'd be talking heads and steely dan so out of the the five albums that you chose uh this is the one that i really have to get back to because again with the 28 songs you know you listen through it and it's a lot to take in so it's one that you you need a few listens to sink your teeth into it and and to differentiate between the 28 songs and remember what happened in what song instead of it kind of blurring together so uh I, i like what i heard and i'm excited to go back and actually you know further explore this album especially with all the the uh, insight that you provided for it uh today so i have uh, a few reviews and then uh, a couple questions to wrap up so uh, rolling stone described the album's music as hooky rock that infuses songwriting smarts and a love of melody like you mentioned with a sometimes spiky sometimes whimsical sense of experimentation then The Guardian gave the album a positive review, stating that Pollard's songs are gems that stayed just the side of self-conscious eccentricity, and the song's lengths were just enough time for, for him to wheeze a few oblique lines and guitarist Tobin Sprout to trace out a raucous melody. A uh, couple more things. Pitchfork has the album in their top 100 albums of the 90s at number 27, and Magnet named it the best album of 1995. 
So that's that's everything I have for that album. Any any last thing you want to add before we we just the the kind of the kind of you know he, he Pollard was his own Brian Eno. He he put the he made these records the, a song called Chicken Blows, which is a very Beatles kind of ballad, I guess. There's a there's a weird vibrato in his voice. It turns out someone is 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 pounding his back like this. So it goes chicken blows. That's the vibrato. Someone's pounding, karate chopping on his back like this. And then a, a I thought a, they added like a phaser or something going on. And then then a backing vocal comes in, and then it comes in really loud. And then they they just oh that's too loud. Let's turn it. And then it's almost gone. There there's there's a haphazardness to the mixing that just makes it all work somehow. It shouldn't, you shouldn't, you know, you could listen to this and go, this is a bad demo, but somehow it's not. It's again, like it's, it's, it's bringing you into this soundscape that, that no one, no one's been able to replicate, you know, and even with a full band, it, it, it always sounds things are indistinct but they sound great you know the the some you can hear the drummer losing tempo and it doesn't matter just just like a like a 60s or 70s recording i feel like all those little quirks are a part of what make the album endearing you know like that make it unique yeah and it's just but it's like i said it's one fantastic song after after another 